Good morning, River Road Grace. How are we today? Fantastic. I got my work cut out for me. You know, I'm, I'm excited about today because something happens here today that's, well, I think some of you have been waiting for. Oh, we start chapter two in the book of Mark. Like, like we've, we've been, right? See, for some of you are like, what's so big about that? Well, when you spend eight weeks in one chapter, you kind of start looking forward to something else. But let me tell you, you're starting to get a whole lot more of the same, okay? I just, I don't want to burst your bubble. I just want you to know where Mark is going is still where Mark is going that he simply laid a foundation for in chapter one. A couple of years ago, uh, I know uh, probably a little bit more than maybe even a couple, but there was a movie that came out that kind of swept people by surprise. It was entitled The Greatest Showman. Uh, Jack, um, uh, Hugh Jackman was one of the lead characters in that, and it was kind of a, a semi-quasi-biography of P.T. Barnum and kind of loosely held on his life and story. And, and the premise of it was that he collected an eclectic group of people that had some kind of oddity, some kind of difference about them that he felt the, the world needed to see. He felt like in some ways, well, some thought he exploited. And he brought people together like tall people, short people. He brought together albino twins. He, he brought out a, a bearded lady. And I just thought that was Arkansas. Um, and, and with that, I... I'm from Arkansas. I can't believe you said that. I'm sorry. Look in the mirror. You know, and, and with that, I, I get the fact that there was this uniqueness to it. There was this oddity to it that, that captured people's attention. He made a lot of money off of it. And it was interesting how the movie kind of depicted people that were on the fringe, people who were on the outside of culture, how desperately they just wanted to look normal. And they recognized the very thing they wanted was the very thing that many people who are, quote, normal can't stand about themselves. And it's amazing how Jesus encounters people on the fringe who think that the thing they want, the thing they need, being their greatest need is really not their greatest need. But Jesus always understood what their greatest need really was. This morning, I want to look at a passage of scripture that we've already looked at this year. We looked at it in our last series when we talked about community. A paralytic on a mat who was carried by four of his friends to Jesus. And today, I want you to see a totally different side of this particular passage of scripture because I think it still speaks in a very different way to us. If you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Mark. Matthew, Mark. Some of you, you've already worn out the first part of this book. You've, you've got it somehow kind of messy in your Bible because you've been turning to it. Amen. Second book in your New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you a free gift of God's Word. Following service today, you can find it at our next steps booth and just let them know, I'd like a Bible. They'd love to give you that as a free gift today. As you follow along on our screens, your electronic device, or your hard copy of God's Word, I just want you to see these words this morning. In Mark chapter 2, we begin today in verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. As some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he arose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and what? Glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. This morning as we walk through this and just kind of break this up in ways in which we not only understand, but we can apply. 
If you're in a life group this week and and you find yourself talking about this, the first thing I would kind of point you to is understanding, number one, what do we have here with these friends? We have determination for a friend. Determination for a friend. And we took a lot of time, the last time we looked at this passage, talking about these four individuals and, and the purpose and the reality behind their steps. But today I want to look at this just a touch differently, and I want you to see how this kind of takes shape, because what it tells us right out of the gate that Jesus has come back, and where was Jesus? As you go back into chapter one and where we were last week, we see he has an encounter with a leper. And as he deals with the the disease of a leper, and we recognize that that physical disease of that time of that culture was a spiritual representation like leprosy was then is our sin today. It was a physical representation of a spiritual reality now. And Jesus deals with that leper not only by healing him, but dealing with the sin. And he says to him, hey, don't go, don't go out and tell anybody. Just silently, quietly, go back, show yourself to the priest. And what does the leper do? Jesus says, go tell no one. And he goes and tells everyone. We talked about that last week with the church. God's told the church to go tell everybody, and we tell no one. And this guy gets healed by Jesus, and what does he do? He disobeys right out of the gate after getting a healing. I don't know about you in your life group, but in our life group this week, we talked about this. How can a man get such a touch by Jesus, get such an encounter, and the first thing he does is disobedience? Well, we sang today about how good our Father is. You want to know how good he is? A guy who he just has an encounter with who does a unique healing in his life, touches his life to where he has radically changed, and he goes out and disobeys immediately. And you know what? Jesus didn't take his healing away. No more than when you come to know him as your personal Lord and Savior, and sin creeps back into your picture, does he take your salvation away. He is good, and he is faithful. And in this, the consequences of him telling everybody was that now the crowds all begin to gather again and it forced him back out into the wilderness because he could not operate and preach and teach the way he, well, he came to do because of the crowds. So he leaves the city, goes out into the wilderness. We see him do a number of different times. Crowds have gone away, things have calmed back down and now he's come back in to the city more than likely as we see to, to Peter's mother-in-law's home and, well, people start to hear about it again. And this crowd that gathers engulfs this house. Now remember before we talked about it, it said the city, not just a, a few people, not 10 or 20 or 30, but, but hundreds of people. It, it had to have a sense of kind of like a, a mosh pit in a Bible study. Like, I can't believe that the home they gathered in had any more room than this platform would have on it. And could you imagine putting two or 300 people up here as Jesus is trying to teach? And it's that, I know for some of you, you might be a, a little older than, than this picture, but some of you are still the age that you might remember what it meant to be in a mosh pit. Yeah, amen. Yeah, and it's just, it's like, yeah, they just, and it's just, it's dirty and it's smelly, it's aggressive, it's, it's consuming to an individual that when they're in it, it's all about them. They don't care about the person beside them, they don't care about who they smash into, they don't care about who falls down, they don't care about anything in that mosh pit but themselves. And I have to believe that there is a, a very similar spirit to this crowd that has come to Jesus not to hear him teach, but to get touched. When's my time to have a moment with the healer? When's my time to get my miracle? When's my time to get the the spotlight on me? I need Jesus and I need all of y'all to get out of my way so I can get to Jesus. Who cares about a guy on a pallet when I've got my need? And they can't get this guy through an audience of people that are consumed with self. Can you imagine this? The pushing, the shoving, the the pain, the discomfort of those that have come for healing that there's no hope. And in the midst of all this, what does Mark capture in his writing about Jesus and what he's doing? It says, and Jesus was teaching 
the word to them. Like in, in a chaotic moment where there is such a large crowd, Jesus is doing what Jesus always does. He is teaching the word to them. He is teaching the gospel. Repent of your sins. Turn from your ways. Follow me. And that gets lost in the midst of a chaotic moment that Jesus is still being consistent in preaching his way to the cross. The gospel. And he's calling them, repent of your sins. We set up the book of Mark by remembering that as Mark is in a kind of a writing in a furious manner to get them to a place of chapter 8, chapter 10, to remind them of the hope that they need as a hurting, persecuted people in Rome. And once again, we see where Mark does less about trying to speak of Jesus' words and now tries to capture more of his actions. Like rarely do we get Mark having great detail of what Jesus says and so much more about what Jesus does. And so in this moment, what he does is he begins to talk about this dramatic picture of five guys that are trying to move their way through hundreds of people to get their friend to Jesus. Why? Because he's paralyzed. He's hurting. He's hopeless. And they've each taken a corner of this pallet and have walked him for a considerable distance more than likely to get him to Jesus. They're desperate to get to Jesus. Why? Because they believed that Jesus was somebody who was like nobody else. They believe the stories they've heard. They believe the testimony that has met their ears, that has intersected their lives, that this man could touch their friend, this paralytic, and be healed. So they try to get him to Jesus. But the crowd is no help. It's thick. It's dense. More than likely, potentially it's selfish. It's about themselves, not for a guy on a pallet. It's interesting when you read through the book of Mark, when you see crowds that have gathered, rarely is the crowd an attribute Almost every single time, the crowd is nothing but a hindrance of Jesus being able to do what Jesus came to do. And so often, the crowd is the very thing that keeps people from having access to Jesus. And I want you to see this. Jesus is trying to work around the crowds, and sometimes, what does he do? He'll even preach a message that's hard for the crowd to accept. Why? To get them to go away. Moments like when he says, you have to... Eat of my flesh, drink of my blood to call yourself my disciple to follow me. And there are people like, man, that, that guy's a freak. We're out of here. What in the world is he talking about? And Jesus recognizes the, the potential hindrance that a crowd has to people getting to him. And yet our churches today are more consumed with getting crowds than we are than preaching the word. Right? We want a crowd. Man, if we could just get a bigger one. I read this week. I'm not going to tell you where or who because you might show up. There's a church giving away a car at Easter. Huh? Which one? I'm, I'm, what kind of car? You know, and, and we'll freak out. We got, we got churches having helicopters fly in to drop Easter eggs on their property for all the kids to go get their candy. Another friend of mine has the Easter bunny coming so they can have family portraits in their foyer. Why? To get a bigger crowd. To gather more people because that's where our success is, we think. If we could just have more people. And in order to get a bigger crowd, you gotta stay away from controversial topics. You gotta stay away from things that make people feel uncomfortable. Pastor, you gotta give the crowd what they want in order for the crowd to come back. Don't give them what they need. And yet Jesus did not come for crowds. He came to make converts. He didn't want decisions. He wanted disciples. That's what he's trying to do. And I think we have to be honest enough to examine whether or not we look a lot like the crowd then today. They obstruct access to Jesus. Let me ask her, are you a part of that crowd? 
And I'm going to get in, I'm going to get my seat, I'm going to get my worship on. Worst phrase in the American culture today, I'm going to get my worship on. What? Last time I checked, it had nothing to do with you and what you get on. It has everything to do with him and what he receives and the glory we allude to him. We lift to him, not your worship, his worship. And I'm going to get in there. I'm going to get my seat, sing my songs. I'm going to get what I want out of this today. I don't care about anyone else's needs. I'm not here for anybody else. I'm, I'm here to get what I need this week, Pastor. I just need my need met. Everybody else can fend for themselves. Man, that's, that's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy how that can filter into the church, how it can filter into people that say we love one another and we love our king, we love our savior, but at the end of the day, how much do we show up week in and week out for what we get out of it? And churches will gather and they'll do crazy things to gather more people. But the saying is true today as it's always been. If it's the crazier things that have gathered people, you have to continue to do crazier things to keep people. Jesus wasn't consumed with doing crazy things to gather a crowd. And here's the thing, though. If you're trying to gather crowds versus trying to make disciples, your church is so much more likely to look more like the world than it will Jesus. And being in a crowd around Jesus is not being the same as being a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus had crowds all around him, but they were not made up of disciples that wanted him. And so what does he do? He makes them feel a little uncomfortable. And there are church leaders. I can't say that there haven't been moments I've wrestled with this, but there, there are church leaders that will work tirelessly to come up with more successful ways to make lost people in a room feel more comfortable. Listen, God has worked in my life over the last few years in some pretty unique and uh, substantial ways to remind me, Corey, until you get comfortable enough in your skin, until you get comfortable enough to be who I've called you to be, you're going to miss out on the blessings of seeing me do through you what I desire to do. And what that means is, is I had to stop thinking, I had to communicate like somebody else that I admired or I follow or, or I think has uh, this idea of success. And, and, and God just began to work in my life to say, Corey, if you will just teach truth and let me handle the rest, things will be a lot smoother. And the problem with that is, is that there are sometimes people look at me sideways like, Corey, that... That doesn't make me feel very comfortable. Corey, that, that kind of stirred me to, to feel something. I don't want to feel again. Corey, I don't like it when you preach that way. Corey, I don't like it when you say those things. But here's the problem. My job's not to make you feel comfortable. Matter of fact, it's just the opposite. Why? Because there's nothing about the gospel when it reveals who we are in the midst of it that's comfortable. Like when the gospel begins to reveal in our life the need for the forgiveness of that brokenness, of that, that reality in our life that just simply is, is consuming, is sinful, is hurtful, that when the gospel intersects that, something in our life shifts and it's uncomfortable. And the more you learn about Jesus and the more you desire to serve him, to know him, to recognize his goodness, to recognize his faithfulness, the more you begin to follow him, the less you'll be concerned about you. And here's the thing, though. When you hear truth about yourself and truth about God, the word and the truth about the gospel, it's uncomfortable. But church, if you come in week after week after week and you feel totally comfortable here, one of us is not doing our job. Because the truth about who God is, it refuses to let us feel comfortable. Refuses. God does not want you feeling comfortable about you. Matter of fact, he wants you in places where your dependence is on him. 
And only when I recognize my desperate need for the grace, the mercy, the love of a good God do I stop thinking more about me and I begin to think more about him. I get lost in him. I recognize I'm forgiven in him. I get filled by him and I stop worrying less about me. And what we have here, Mark has these guys Four guys, they're holding a pallet of a, a paralytic and they're desperate to get him to the feet of Jesus. And so what do they do? They get their friend up on the roof. And why is that a problem? Because Jesus isn't on the roof, he's under it. And they get him up there. And can you imagine this for a moment? After they get their friend up on the roof and They've come up with the plan, they, devise the, they have the conversation, devise the plan of digging a hole in the roof. I, I know all the moments that Peter says some pretty, what we perceive to be idiotic things. And there are moments I love Peter's heart, but I have to believe Mark doesn't capture Peter's moment here. But, but I have to believe if Peter sees what he sees falling from the roof as they dig this hole, and not a hole to get their head through to see what's going on, a hole that's large enough to drop their friends through. I have to believe that that Peter in this moment's like, Jesus, I hope you're prepared to do a resurrection because I'm about to kill somebody. They're tearing up my roof. And why would they do this? Because there is nothing better in this world than to introduce one of your friends to Jesus Christ. Parent, there is nothing greater in this world than to introduce one of your children to Jesus Christ in a way they find and receive a savior. Husbands, there's nothing greater than to introduce a wife. Wife, nothing greater than to introduce a husband to Jesus and they find the redemptive savior that loves them desperately for them to know what he came to do for the remission of our sin. Student, there's nothing like a classmate you introduced to Jesus. Last week, we, we saw people at the end of both services come forward to say, I, I want to know Jesus personally. And, and they walked over into our venue and they sat down with people that opened up God's word and just began to show them what it really means, what, what scripture says about knowing Jesus Christ personally. Not knowing about him, knowing him. And their lives were radically changed. But here's the thing, as many of the testimonies of those that came out wanting to talk about finding Jesus, I heard from those that got to sit down with them. And I saw the faces and their smiles, and they're like, man, you, you can't believe what happened. They, they pray, they, they, they walk through the word, and, and I'm just, they're like, Whoa. And I'm like, right? Right? Like, like, there is nothing greater than to introduce somebody to the forgiveness of sin, to the healing that our Savior brings in the brokenness that we don't deserve. And they were beaming. And it begs the question, Do we desire to be part of that audience or more about an audience that just simply came to get what we want out of Jesus in a place for me? There's something else that happens here. There's faith in a savior. So go back and look at verse five. When Jesus saw their faith, that's a remarkable sentence. He saw their faith. And guess what? Everyone else did too. If you were sitting underneath this portion of the roof, you not only saw their faith, you felt their faith fall on you. You recognized in this moment somebody was doing something so unique, so extraordinary, that it was visible to everybody in the room, including Jesus. And let me tell you, real faith is never invisible. Never. Now, faith itself is invisible, but the consequences of that faith is always visible. Always. It's always evident. Invisible faith has visible evidence. That's it. What you believe on the inside will always manifest itself on the outside. Always. What you really believe, the world will know. Real faith cannot hide. 
He cannot hide. In other words, you cannot say, I believe in Jesus, and it never show. Hear me. If you haven't felt uncomfortable yet, let me help you. Um, love you. Love you. I'll say it again. Love you. But if all you think about faith in Jesus is a belief that there is a God, a belief that you are a Christian, but no one in the world can see the evidence of you being a Christian, you're probably not one. Love you, church, the evidence of our faith in a big, glorious King, Lord, Savior cannot be hidden in here and it be real. There is nothing about who he is that should give us pause to tell a world who desperately needs to know who he is. Like if you encounter situations where the brokenness of this world is on full display and you're like, I'm not saying anything. Jesus is saying, that's why I put you here. If there are people near you, you have purpose. If there are people in your life who are hurting, you have purpose. It's why James says in James 2.14, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it in your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Now, you might have a lot of different things to say about that question in James, but let me tell you, the only answer is no. Like, no. That kind of faith cannot save because real faith has real evidence. Come to Jesus. It is not too late. If you're saying, Pastor, I don't know that I have that kind of faith. Well, here's the beautiful thing. What Jesus does in us, he doesn't do because we've already been equipped. See, Jesus doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. And when you begin to realize that it's not about what you bring to the table that he chooses to redeem, it's what you can't bring to the table that he redeems that brings him glory. And today, if you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't really care what he says, I'm, a, I'm an upstanding individual in this community and people know me and they love me and, and that's enough in God's eyes. I just love you enough to tell you it's not. And it doesn't matter what Oakdale thinks about you. It matters what the king thinks about you. And he says it clearly. I came for the remission of sins. I came to seek and save the lost. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. And no man comes to the Father but through him. Like, like I can't be honest enough with you today to try and make you feel comfortable because when you intersect the gospel, something in us wants to say, I don't like that. And Jesus says, because it's the sin in your life that says, come back. I'm gonna hold on to you. I'm gonna pull you back into the darkness because the darkness hates the light. But I want you to see what happens with these friends, what they show. And number one, there's real faith is persistent. They don't give up. How easy would it have been for them to say, man, look at all this crowd, look at all these people, and look at the, the, the tenaciousness of them getting to Jesus. Let's all just wait out here, let's let the crowds leave, and, and we'll wait to get to Jesus. They don't do that. Let's come back tomorrow, and maybe we'll get a chance to, they don't do that. Regardless of the outward expression of this massive crowd, they get their friend to the feet of Jesus. And here's the amazing thing to me. Because it's not my job to make people feel comfortable, I realize there are moments I say things that people don't agree with. And hear me, I'm okay with that. I, I'm, I'm fine sitting down with people and talking about differences. I'm fine to sit down over lunch or breakfast and talk about what we're exploring or what we're working through or what we're wrestling with. But... I'm amazed at how many people say, you know what? I got my feelings hurt at church and I'm just done. I quit. I don't know that I believe in Jesus anymore. Because I didn't get what I wanted out of it. 
Like I didn't get the, the experience I was hoping to get from this thing called church. And everybody told me about it. Matter of fact, I did it for like 20 years, but, but I'm done because I got offended. Do you realize in the moment that you want to walk away is the very moment you need to be at the feet of Jesus even more? Like the moment you have a difference with somebody, whether it's me or another leader or somebody in the church, is the very moment your persistence to get to Jesus kicks into overdrive to say, I need more of him because I'm getting consumed with me. I'm getting wrapped up in what I want and what I think and what I didn't get when Jesus is saying, listen, that's the moment you get so persistent to get to my feet so you can hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant. You ran the race well. You ran with endurance when it got hard. You ran when no one else ran with you. You ran well. You fought a good fight, not, I'm out of here because I don't like the preacher. I don't like the music. I don't like the programs. They don't have a smoke machine. Man, I so wish the Apostle Paul could walk in on some churches. I'd love to have a conversation about what we call priority. Because, see, real faith is creative. They ripped open a roof, people. Like, catch this. They ripped a hole in someone else's roof. And I I don't know that they're stopping as much to say who's going to fix this, even though I believe that's still on their radar, that they're going to make that right, because... When you really care about somebody, you're gonna do some extraordinary things to get them to Jesus. And hear me, if you love property more than you do people, you will always miss the heart of Jesus. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out here, and I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna give some kudos. I don't do this very often, but we have an amazing team of people that do incredible work to make this property and our facilities look the way they do every time you come and gather here. Like, our, our, I'll say amen to that. Yeah. I don't say that to give them glory. I don't say that to just simply point them out. I'm telling you, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to keep this property and our facilities looking the way they do. But do you know why they do it? Not so that somebody will notice how clean it is, so that the property is not the hurdle someone has to get over to hear about Jesus. That they don't want trash in a parking lot to be the first impression to somebody that's coming to hear the first time about Jesus. And they recognize the importance we place on our property is so that it is a tool for people to engage the king and not a hindrance of them hearing from him. But when you make the tool, you make the properties the priority, you will always miss people. Like Jesus never said the church building was sacred. The people in it that make up the church are Like this brick, this mortar, this plaster, this metal, all of this stuff is a tool. It's not sacred. You are. And when you gather together, God does something unique. He does something powerful. He does something in a way that shifts this inside nature. Because we desire to love him more than we do our stuff. Well, wait, wait, Pastor, you mean just at the church, right? Like, I mean, I, I like our church. I, I think it's really pretty. And all, but, but that doesn't, like, go to my home, does it? Like, it's okay for me to love my stuff. That's a whole different sermon. But these four men believed their friend was worth it. Who in your life is worth ripping a hole in a roof for to get them to Jesus. Like right now, who in your mind instantly at that question says, that's who I would rip a hole in a roof for? Pastor, I, I don't have a name that comes to mind. Here's one of the things I've learned in ministry. We typically never get answers to questions we're not asking. And today, if you say, well, pastor, I don't really have somebody that comes to mind about 
digging a hole in a roof to get them to Jesus. Would you start praying this week, God, would you show me somebody that I could take to Jesus? God, would you show me this week somebody I could invite to Easter? I love your faces. I don't always look at them when I'm preaching, but, but there are many of your faces I see week after week after week after week. And I am thankful I see your faces. Like you are faithful and I love it. But if we have an Easter service full of faces I've never seen before because you drug them to Jesus, I'm absolutely okay with that. You say, well, Corey, I thought you didn't want a crowd. I'll take a crowd of lost people every single day if they don't know Jesus and I can tell them the gospel. Jesus was preaching his way to the cross and he was intentional about it. And these real friends, not only did they have a persistent faith and a creative faith, they also had a, a faith that was sacrificial. Folks, hear me, this cost them their effort, it cost them their time, but recognize if this were to go south, if this went sideways, do you recognize the reputation they would have from this point forward? <laughs> there goes that, those guys Jesus had to rebuke because they, inter, they interrupted his preaching. There are those guys that they had the audacity to like dig a hole in Peter's mother-in-law's home. Like, like, look at those guys. and They put it all on the line for their friends. Do you think for a moment that you can follow Jesus and it costs you nothing? Folks, it's gonna cost your time. It's gonna cost your reputation. It's gonna cost you your relationships, your, your everything. And that's why Jesus says, count the cost. You say, well, pastor, I'm not willing to give up my reputation. Well, here's the thing. I hear people say that because they don't know what they're trading it for. I got a reputation of being the high school football star. Who cares when you're 52? <laughs> like if you're at the bar still telling the same stories that you were telling about high school 25 years later, you need Jesus. Like I'm just telling you, you need a new story. If you're at the water cooler having the same conversations about the same individual that none of you like, you need Jesus. Because the people at the water cooler are more concerned about the story in the workplace than they are the gospel. Like, well, Corey, that, come on, you can't talk about Jesus all the time, can't you? Like, like I'm not saying be this freak that's like, hey, I love Jesus, can I tell you? I'm just saying, listen, can you intersect someone's brokenness and say, you know what, that's really dirty stuff, like that's ugly and I get it and things are messed up, but that's why I think Jesus is so amazing because he loved me even in my worst moments. He forgave me even when I was so unforgivable. He, he showed me grace when I don't deserve it. And you know what? That person, they need some grace too. Because they're probably going to keep making the same messed up copies. They're probably going to do the wrong report. They're going to live out the wrong directions. They're, they're going to make some more mistakes. You know, I'm just thankful God showed me some grace like I need to show them. And people will be like, you're weird. And Jesus will be like, I'm proud of you. I'll take that. I want to hear well done. And you see, I thought grace was free. Salvation's free. Grace is free, but it'll cost you everything the rest of your life to follow him. Everything. And they had fortitude for this friend to get him to the Savior. And number three, there was forgiveness for a sinner. Forgiveness for a sinner. Look at this. I think we've got to see this just for what it is. Look at verse five. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, I have to stop and look at this for what it is. Like, I don't know how you read it. I don't know if you're like, oh, like you have some high spiritual moment. I have to read this for I believe the way it really looked in a moment. Remember, these guys have dug a hole. I don't know how close to the hole they are, but they've, they've lowered him down. They've got him to the feet of Jesus. And you know that they are tuned into this moment to hear Jesus say the words they desperately wanted their friend to hear. And they hear, your sins are forgiven. What? Come on, Jesus, we didn't do all this to hear that. 
Your sins are forgiven. We wanted to heal. We wanted to hear you are healed. It's like we wanted our friend to get a healing today and you talk about sins. Ah! Jesus. It's like the last time I had to go to the ER with a kidney stone. And I was in the ER, and man, I just, I was like, Lord, just take me home. I mean, just come on, it, it is good, I am good, like, let's just go home, this hurts, I, I'm ready to see you, I don't know if you're ready to see me, but man, it just hurts, it hurts, and I got a doctor come in, and I'm just like, oh, somebody better do something, because I'm about to, oh, and if I were to hear a doctor say, Corey, your sins are forgiven, <laughs> I'd been like, what? Does that mean no morphine? I mean, does that, like, I, I, I'm glad that, that you want to deal with my sins, but I'm hurting here right now. And Doc, I, I need something to deal with the pain, and you want to talk about sins. He's been a paralytic for years. And what he thought and what his friends thought was his greatest need was not his greatest need. The forgiveness of his sins was his greatest need. And I'm gonna go a step further, and I said this, I said this Friday at Landon Stever, his, his memorial, a celebration of his life. I'm gonna go a step further and say that your sins and the forgiveness of your sins is not your greatest need. Your greatest need is to deal with the separation between you and God. The sin is just simply the thing that's caused the consequence of that separation. See, to have forgiveness of your sin and not be any closer to God and deal with the separation between you and him, well, that'd be futile. When Jesus said your sins are forgiven, he was addressing the separation between man and its creator. And he was bridging that gap with that, that salvation, that gospel story of saying, I've come to resolve the difference, to resolve the distance between you and the creator. And in a moment that he was desperate to hear, you are healed, he hears his greatest need being met that he didn't even know was his greatest need. I'm gonna give you what you really need. Because what good is it to heal your body and you still go to hell? Now, now, hear me. I've already said this, I'll say it again. I love you. But if you pray for your friend that lost a job to get a job, or a friend that's filed bankruptcy because of their lack of finances, or you, you pray for someone to get sick, who, or to get well who has been sick, and you know they don't know Jesus, what good is it to pray for them to be wealthy to walk into hell? Like what good is it for them to be employed and be separated from God? And these men that brought him to Jesus were so concerned about this need that was this outward need, but Jesus dealt with the real need and for us as a church, we gotta start asking who in our life has a real need that they themselves don't even see? And tell them the gospel. Like, Pastor, you've been talking about the gospel like every week for like a month. Why don't you teach on Revelation? If you don't get the gospel, you don't need the book of Revelation. Like, if we as a church don't understand the importance of telling the world about Jesus, what good is it to know what happens to the world if we don't care what happens? Folks, the gospel is at the forefront of our mission and our calling, not an understanding of the end time. Is that important? Yes, it is. But the end time should remind us of how desperately we should be telling the world, Jesus loves you, he died for you, and desires for you to have eternity with him. That was free. That's not in my notes. If you're sitting back saying, but I'm afraid to say something. Let me, let me be clear. When you have this thing of saying, well, I'm, Pastor, I'm just afraid to say the wrong thing. I'm afraid to say something. You're not afraid of them. You're not thinking of them. You're thinking of you. You've got to look past the immediate and see the eternal. That immediate need that we see on the outside is not their eternal need. What is their greatest need? Tell them about Jesus. And this week in our life group, someone said, Corey, you know, you... You make it sound like easy, like, 
You just tell someone, the guy's like, how, how do you do that? That's why I still wear this. It almost seems like a kid's bracelet, but it just simply is so clear, brokenness. And what comes out of that brokenness in our life? All the things we try to fill brokenness. And I can talk to anybody about brokenness. I can talk to my waiter for 20 minutes. I, my food get cold because I can talk about brokenness when they tell me all the stuff in their life that's falling apart. And I can tell them, you know what, man, I'm, can I just tell you that someone introduced me to Jesus and, and they told me about the fact that he, he died for me even in the midst of all my brokenness because I didn't deserve it. And man, when, when I found out how much Jesus loved me and desired to heal that brokenness in my life, when he died on the cross, and he died for my sins, and he rose again three days later to conquer death and to conquer that brokenness in my life. He now, well, he desired to bring me back into God's plan for my life, and that was to have a relationship with him. If you can't share the gospel in two minutes or less, rethink the way you share the gospel. What's your story? How did you come to meet Jesus? I'm gonna guess you realized you had brokenness in your life and someone told you who would like to intersect that brokenness, step into that brokenness and bring healing. And everyone wants healing for our brokenness. Everyone wants to know they're redeemable. Everybody wants to know that they're forgivable. And when Jesus intersects your story with his gospel of good news, the world's different. We've gotta get the hope of the world to the hopelessness of the world. We've got to meet their greatest need.